It's member-supported Hawaii Public Radio, HPR, and All Things Considered. I'm Dave Lawrence. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a, uh, a fun Friday that we're having here in our Atherton Performing Arts Studio. It's one of my favorite spaces to get to be in. And we are joined today by three-quarters of the Manhattan Transfer. You may have been listening when we had Cheryl Benteen as our guest last week on the program. Third through Sunday at the Blue Note, Cheryl's joined by Janice Siegel, Trist Curlis. Thank you guys for coming. Thank you for having Our us. Pleasure. Yeah. It's great to have you here. And uh, you've already done, not a lot of bands do the two weekend kind of routine. I'm trying to think of anybody I remember. Maybe they have a lot of acts, so it's hard to keep track of. But how did, how did the first set of dates go here? Janice? Fabulous. Fantastic. Oh, yeah. I mean, we, this is a dream gig. The audiences have been extremely responsive to, and two shows a night, you know, gives us a chance to really go through some of our repertoire. We have, we have a couple of songs, you know. Right. We yeah, we were just joking out. about that before the interview <laughs> with Trist. Explain how putting together the set list works when you have, like you were saying, all of this material. What, what goes into putting it together for a show? Well, I think um, it's tough because you have to... You have to negotiate between your artistic desires mm. and the reality of your performance and what your audience is there for. Right. I mean, grateful to have songs that people show up wanting to hear. Not every artist has that. So right. we're grateful to have that. So we kind of need to give some of that. So while it's not exactly only you know all the hits per se, there's definitely songs that people are expecting to hear in within that pool of songs we try to choose quite a few of those um while still doing you know uh songs from deep within the catalog sure. that we haven't maybe done in a while or or any new thing that we have so the artistic desire is always yep that's that stuff but here's these new things that we're right. doing and you have to keep that in check with oh right but people want to hear these songs that were big hits or that the fans have it's enjoyed balance. over the years so it's usually just a balance of that making sure you have that and Kind of making sure everyone is represented in the set too, um, you know, just so the audience has different sounds to hear. Right, different the show. flavors of yeah. what each each of you offer. Yeah. And and Cheryl, is there ever any? Are there any market specific? Sometimes, for example, there's bands like like Hall and Oates. They had a couple of their big hits covered by local artists here in the mid '70s. Mm -hmm. These are they had a couple of songs rather deeper songs that were turned into big hits um, by local artists. So when they come to Hawaii, they play these couple of songs that in the rest of the country or world they would never play on stage but because yeah. local artists made them really popular do you guys have any market specific songs that you in certain cities like this city that we've got i mean obviously in new york there might be some but yeah i think there's only a couple exceptions there i know italy they went nuts for soul food to go okay. that was a huge thing <laughs> um um where else um, um um speak up mambo was that in more Spain? Spain? Um, the Chanson de Moore, we only perform in Europe, there really, we and yeah. then only certain countries, where it means nothing in the United States. Right. Yeah, that's yeah. it's always fascinating to me, and I knew with a band yeah. like this that yeah. it, it would have those. Oh, and Smile Again in the Philippines. So we have interesting little little pockets. Of anything here hits. that comes out, or is this a no, right in the just, middle kind uh, of thing? Just they're just great. They We're going to have everything. a little everything yeah. in our show. No, yeah. we like that, Janice. I'm wondering. Uh, if the synapses will provide this for us, it was a long time ago, but your debut in Hawaii was mm -hmm. uh, ending your 77 world tour. Steve, the mystery emailer who provides me all this local invaluable history. I mean, everything, you name it. The first time anybody played in the town, reviews of their shows, what they might have said. You were at the Hilton Hawaiian Village. It was September 77. And, and again, it wrapped up the 1977 world tour. Any memories of that? That's oh. your debut. <laughs> Um, it wrapped up the tour. That's what it said in then, uh, Steve's email. It was the just, final dates of the okay, tour. Okay, I just remember an extremely grueling world tour and ending it in mm. Maui, I think. So okay. probably the Hawaiian date was the last date. I remember the Hawaiian village. And was it a private show? Uh, it didn't say that, but your mm. recollection, a lot of people do tag a Maui on there too. But then we went and just collapsed <laughs> somewhere on Maui. Nice and, place to collect. Right, right. Yeah. I was going to say. A lot of, and a lot of artists do that, I think, yeah. for just that reason, that it is wow. a, a nice place uh, yeah. to do that. Tris, did you see these guys before you joined the band? And can you remember uh, being introduced to their sound? Um, I remember both of those things. I think I only saw the group one time. Uh, 
they hate when I do the dates and stuff. But when I was in college, um, I saw them. I saw them in Billings, Montana. Wow! At the Alberta Bear Theater, the only time that I saw them perform live, I believe. Um, so that would have been ninety. 1990 by the time I finally saw them I heard them as long as I can remember almost I I think my first memory of being introduced to their sound would have been boy from New York City I grew up in Cheyenne Wyoming right. and of course having that be more of a, of a radio hit that was played um, you know throughout throughout my life musically I was always attracted to no matter what the style if it had harmony in it if it had vocals, uh, vocal harmony, um, I was always attracted to it. So having, it's primarily a lead vocal, but right. hearing those harmony parts in the choruses and then the kind of the vocal bass part now and again, I was always into that. Yeah. So I was, I was into that. And then as I started to get into doing that stuff myself in high school, um, you know, the Vocalese album kind of just blew my mind and still does. <laughs> uh, so that was, that was really the, really the falling in love with them and then checking out as much as I could. And that correlated also with my voice change from being kind of the highest soprano around to <laughs> this low voice that I didn't know what to do with. And so there were these places in the songs that had Spots Tim singing it. these little low parts. And I was like, oh, that's me. Like I finally had an identity. So I sought out any music that had a low singer in it. So like the Oak Ridge boys, right. uh, the persuasions, the nylons, take six came along. Anybody that had this low voice, whether it was acapella or not, I was sure. always seeking that out. So that was kind of my entryway into wanting to know more about, about them. You mentioned him and, and, uh, Tim, of course, who, uh, figures heavily into into the whole C, uh, the band, uh, Manhattan Transfer, and that's, again, who we're talking with on, on All Things Considered today. Janice, can you tell the interesting story of how it was Tim's taxi driving that mm -hmm. led to some band members meeting each other? And I think it's fascinating. That's, that's completely true. Um, Tim was driving a cab in Manhattan to make ends meet. He had just uh, disbanded the first group, or they went on without him. Some, you know, they had one record on Capitol called Jukin. And he was working construction, and then he's, it was too hard on him. So he, he got a, a, a cabbie license. He actually picked up Laurel Massé right. as a fare uh, at 2, 2 a.m. One, one New York evening. She was in hot pants, I believe, and he always <laughs> did love tall blondes. She was a blonde at that time. And she flagged him down, and sat in the, she sat in the back seat and said, what do you do besides drive a cab? And he's, that opened up the floodgates. Right. And she said, well, I really want to be a singer. And why don't we go out for coffee? And, you know, don't take me home. Let's go for coffee. So they did. And he took her number to come sing on a demo he was doing. And then I met him through the cab as well. And it was uh, Laurel's, boyfriend of Laurel's that was working on Broadway who introduced you and Tim to Alan. That's correct. Yeah, Alan was uh, in the original cast of uh, Grease on Broadway. He was Teen Angel. He created the role. Yeah, that's a really, it's neat how the roads come together. Sometimes. Well, it's just a crazy, I mean, people think in we're a, making this cab. up, but it's it's like the script of a B-movie, really. Right. And or a Broadway show. Any, or a Broadway exactly. show, if there's any producers yeah. out there. I keep trying to get us. I think it's a more up, up, <laughs> right? up from B-movie to more like a Broadway. It's just okay. a good story. I'll go for that. Yeah. I'll go for that. It holds there. your attention. I'll go for that. And it, and it has a real... Um, authentic sort of sort of origin and cheryl uh again who was my guest already on the phone prior to getting here you were in the new deal rhythm band and it was the trombone player who introduced you yes oh you remembered that he was my boyfriend at the time <laughs> a lot of like boyfriends coming involved <laughs> i know i, I know there's always romance in music right <laughs> yeah he gave me two albums he gave me manhattan transfer uh you know the first album which blew my mind and he also gave me tell me the truth john hendrix weird combo at the time because now look how how yeah. everything uh right. turned out john hendrix is you know we've sung a lot of his music he's a very dear friend of the group and then uh these guys i met it's pretty crazy it is um and there are um, 
You mentioned the one. We didn't really get into it too much, but we we were talking about Ahmet Erdogan and his mm-hmm. role of uh, with the band. Cheryl mentioned some special gigs when we were talking on the phone. One was that 1988 Atlantic Records 40th anniversary mm-hmm. event, yeah. which was at Madison Square Garden with uh, the one of the uh, it was the first time that the Zeppelin dudes reunited with Jason on the drums, filling uh, John's position. Do you have, uh, is there some memories of that? That has to be, um, and you'll put whatever's a more intense one, but that seems to me one of the most incredible nights. Uh, yeah, it was one of many incredible nights with Amit. Um, the, 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 the thing I remember most, though, is the night he f- saw us. The first time? Yes. Talk about that. that. That was at the Bijou Cafe in Philadelphia. And uh, that was kind of a regular gig for us, and we could not get a record deal. We, everybody passed, but our real hope was to be on Atlantic Records, just because of their history. Um, you know, all the great R and B and and jazz that was on Atlantic. Our manager at the time, Aaron Russo, who also managed Bette Midler, that was a changing point in our career. He had the clout and the power and the sheer force of will to get Amit into a limousine, mm. along with various refreshments. <laughs> and drive him to Philadelphia in time. To- he's, he's, Aaron was calling, hold the second show, hold the second show. We're bringing Amit. From New York. Yeah, from New York. And Amit saw us perform and signed us right after. Incredible. Yeah. What a story. And then that relationship lasts for... It was deep and, and meaningful, uh, definitely, for me, certainly. Uh, and, and also to know his brother, um, Nesui who was the, sort of the jazz part of that partnership, where Amit was more rock and roll. Uh, and uh, I met many wonderful musicians. Amit, uh, well, Arif Mardan, Ilhan Mimaraglu, the Turks, <laughs> ran that record company. Any memories you want to share? I was not even there yet. Because they so. had, uh, right, well, I know about that, not on the meeting of the night, but in general yeah. through the years, because you were there later. Well, another um, wonderful evening was the tribute to Amit that uh, obviously he had passed before this. And he, uh, I just remember, I mean, everyone came on stage, and then all of a sudden Mick Jagger walks on stage and just talks. And this man is so articulate, so funny, so witty. I'm going, but it's Mick Jagger, brilliant guy. You know, telling these amazing stories of Amit, but done with such class. It, it, we were all just sitting there, what? And which one, forgive me on that, because I saw the show in London that when Zeppelin reunited with Bill Wyman and Farner and all those people. Which Amit show was this? This was in New York. Okay. This was, this was a, a, at the Rose a Theater. tribute. Yeah. Okay. Rose Theater? Yeah. And Amit and Mick were extremely close, and I think it was at a... It was Stone's a, concert at where the he fell. Yeah, it was at the Beacon at a really? Stone show. Yeah, yeah. he fell, in, and that was sort of the beginning Correct. of. That was what happened. Yeah, wow, I forgot. That. Backstage at the Beacon, but that's a uh, well, that's powerful and and a powerful figure. Um, and uh, as uh, we go to wrap it up, you guys have something coming up that's really um, for fans of this kind of music. You did a tour with Take Six. It got documented in such a way that even though you're not coming together here, they're coming on their own actually later in the year, yeah. but um, mm-hmm. people will be able to experience that. Any highlights of either the tour or perhaps when you were doing the, the filming that comes up, Tris? Well, I mean, for me, as I mentioned before, that's another group that really got me into doing this kind of thing. So I'm, I'm barely over getting to sing with these amazing folks. And now, oh, and now I get to sh- do a show with them as right. well. So <laughs> it's just, it's dreamland for me. So it's it's a blast. And it really, it's really been great to see it develop. It is more, you know, a fantastic evening would be hearing us do a set and hearing Take Six do a set and maybe singing a song together at the end of it would be a really enjoyable time. But this is not that. This is more combining. There's an opening number, um, you know, that is two. even is two opening numbers. You even, you know, it's choreographed and blocked on stage, and some real thought into how do we represent 
each group so you see what each group does mm. maybe if you're only a fan of one and never seen the other you get a taste of what you leave knowing what the other group is about yet you still know that you are part of seeing something that you could only see at that show with the two groups together um forming something else that's special so that's been really great and so to to also be able to capture it uh for pbs uh their show so the show soundstage um, was really delightful, um, you know, because they record in front of a live audience. So we were just doing the concert, uh, you know, our 90-minute show, and they you know, record it with 100 cameras and um, make it just look pretty and uh, uh, shape it into an hour TV special that'll be out in the fall. So let's, it was just exciting to do. So that'll be out in the fall, and also our new record. That's correct. The Junction will be out in the fall. Based That's the title of a, a song that Trist and Merv Warren wrote together. That's so. cool. And that'll be out, what, October, September? Yeah, like... Right like around there. Right around October. when both. They both become Yeah, they both come out. Time. Bam! <laughs> it's a full-on assault from the... That's right. It's only where we Manhattan, do it. Uh, Manhattan Transfer uh, in 2017. Very busy group of folks. Mm-hmm. It's impressive. They're through Sunday, busy here in Honolulu at the Blue Note. It's been a thrill to have Cheryl Benteen, Janice Siegel, Trist Curlis, Manhattan Transfer, joining us in our HPR Atherton Performing Arts Studio on uh, member-supported Hawaii Public Radio as part of All Things Considered. Hope you had fun today. Yes, Absolutely. very much so. Thanks, thanks for having us. Yeah, thanks.